And greetings, friends. In this program, I plan to tell you about the greatest mystery in all of life. Very few people understand this profound mystery. This mystery goes far beyond anything most of you have ever heard before. It has to do with why you are alive. It has to do with the awesome purpose for which you and I are drawing breath. Yet it is not something weird. It's not some idea we've got out of some offbeat religious or philosophy book. You can now understand and prove this mystery to yourself. And if you really get it, this understanding can revolutionize your very life. It really can. Stay tuned. Tomorrow's World presents Roderick C. Meredith. Richard Ames, John O'Quinn, bringing you the good news of your future in tomorrow's world. This week, Roderick C. Meredith asks, why are you alive? And now, Roderick C. Meredith. As a young boy growing up in Missouri, I often used to look up into the sky and wonder, why am I really here? What is life all about? Although my family and I regularly attended a mainstream church, we had no idea why we were really alive. Neither did any of my many friends who also attended mainstream churches. Our minister was a nice man. He was friendly and seemed dedicated to what he understood, but he didn't understand very much. He just kept repeating the basic platitudes about accepting Jesus floating off to heaven with nothing to do. He said virtually nothing about the exciting prophecies of the Bible. One-fourth of your Bible is prophecy, as many of you know, and we cover that on this program. And this man never seemed able to really explain why we were really born or why must men suffer apart from floating off to heaven. Uh, is there some awesome, some exciting purpose that your creator is working out here among men and among nations? Think about it. About 3,000 years ago, King David of ancient Israel looked up at the stars and he wondered out loud about these same questions. Turn to Psalms 8, and that's beginning in verse 3 here. When I look consider your heavens, David wrote, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you've ordained, what is man that you're mindful of him, or the son of man that you visit him? For you have made him a little lower than the angels. He says, you have crowned man with glory and honor. You have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You've put all things under his feet all sheep and oxen, even the beasts of the field and birds of the air, and the fish of the sea that pass through the seas. How small we are by comparison. The great heavens up above us are so vast compared to our little tiny earth and us little ants as we are on this earth. So why are we really alive? Think about that. Turn to Genesis. Genesis 1. Verse 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Then God describes here in his revelation about how he divided the seas from the dry land and how he created the plants and then the animals. And down in verse 26, God said, read this carefully in your Bible, then God said, let us, and this is what nearly all the translations have, I'm not putting this in here, let us, what do you mean let us? Most of us are told that there's just one being back there. No, there were two beings. There was God, the one we call now God the Father, and then there was the one the Bible reveals as the Logos, the spokesman, the one who later emptied himself and became Jesus Christ to die for your sins and my sins. He was there at the beginning, the spokesman for God, the second person in the God family. Let us make man in our image. All of mankind, men and women, all of us are made in the direct image of God according to our likeness and let them have dominion. So we're not just made in the shape. We have the kind of mind and capacity that God has to a limited extent, of course, but God made us in his image to have rule 
Dominion means rule, authority over all the creation. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. Then God blessed them and God said, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. Man's to have authority and have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over everything that moves. Mankind was given dominion, rule, and man was given creative imagination like God himself. Man can now send vehicles into outer space, even to Mars. Man's creative imagination is absolutely boundless. We see these things that have happened. The recent landing of the Discovery spacecraft was a triumph for science. Man has tremendous ability, and we can be grateful for that if that ability is rightly used. But notice again the revelation from God to man, what God began to perceive, and no doubt he understood first, but he let it work itself out. In Genesis 11, notice, now the whole earth, this is after the flood, had one language and one speech. And then men journeyed here to this certain place, and they said in verse 4, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower. They wanted to build a great symbol of man's glory, whose top is in the heavens. And let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered over the face of the earth. So the eternal, the great God who created us in his image came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the eternal said, indeed, the people are one. They all have one language. And this they begin to do. Man began to do that back then. Even then, God could see that man's creative imagination could cause chaos. The misuse of man's creative imagination would cause something that would be awful. And God could see that even at that time. This they begin to do. And now, nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. Again, you can take this as an old Hebrew myth or something. I don't take it that way. And you'd better come to realize later on, as you see the detailed prophecies of the Bible working out step by step, what God said about ancient Egypt exactly happened and is happening. What God said about ancient Tyre happened and is happening. All the other things in the Bible are absolutely true when you get them straight and understand them. This is the revelation from God to mankind. He says, this they begin to do and nothing will be withheld from them. He knew even then that man could quickly, once it was all together, manufacture bombs, rockets, things like that. He didn't want that to occur yet because God has given man 6,000 years to learn the lessons by human experience, by human suffering, that his way is not right. Trying out his ideas is not going to work. And it was not yet time for humans to uh, invent atomic and hydrogen bombs. It was not yet time for man to conquer space. Not yet. That time will come, my friends, but in a vastly different way than mankind now expects. This is all part of the supreme mystery and the awesome purpose which God is working out among humans here on this earth. Notice back in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. In him, speaking of Jesus Christ, one of these long, long verses that Paul wrote, in Christ we have redemption through his blood the, the uh, forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery. Again, God speaks about a mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, pleasure which he purposed in himself that in the dispensation, listen, in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one. God purposes to gather together in one all things in Christ, both in heaven and in earth in him. We're all going to be made one. We're going to be made one family. And when you understand it, we're going to be made one kingdom, one level of existence, one tightly bound family. What does this really mean? Turn to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. And beginning now in verse 24. Paul writes, I now rejoice in the sufferings for you in my sufferings and fill up in my flesh what is lacking of the afflictions of Christ. 
for the sake of his body, which is the church, of which I am a minister, according to the stewardship from God, which was given to me for you, to fulfill the word of God, the mystery. Here he is again, talking about the mystery, which has been hidden, but now has been revealed to his saints. To them God will to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery, mentions mystery here the second time, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. The hope of glory. Most people and most churches talk about that as though we just float off to heaven and somehow we have nothing to do. That's not very much glory. What kind of glory is Christ actually talking about in his word? What kind of glory did he inspire Paul to talk about? Where does all this lead? Think about it. Turn to Romans 8 and verse 16 now. Romans 8 and verse 16. Here we find more about this. Paul writes, The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Yes, we're right now children of God. We have God, if we have God's Spirit in us, that is. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and notice, joint heirs with Christ. We're not supposed to be way down here inheriting something far less. We're joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, and we all go through human sufferings, that we may also be glorified together. God lets us be tried and tested and tested and tried in this crucible of human suffering. People wonder why the horrible things are allowed to happen. To humble man, to help mankind realize how weak we are and how our way does not work out or how much we need the true God. And God is letting us go through this crucible that we may be glorified eventually and in Christ glorified together. For I consider that the sufferings of this present not time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us, not to us, but in us. Turn to verse 28. And we know that all things, think about this, my friends, you have a glorious future ahead if you're willing to really obey this book and put God first in your lives and begin to study this book, act upon it, believe it, do it. All things work together for good for those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. The firstborn among many brothers. Christ will soon have many brothers. Will these be real brothers? Or will they just be goats and cows by comparison? Is God kid kidding himself that we're going to be real brothers? Is this all poetic or something? As many scholars try to make out, no, it's not. We're going to be real brothers of Jesus Christ. And we're going to be born of the Spirit like he was. Follow me. See that this is so in your own Bible. Turn now to Luke chapter 20, if you would. Luke chapter 20, the revelation of Jesus Christ on this. Luke 20, verse 34, Jesus said, The sons of this age marry and are given in marriage. But those who are counted worthy to attain that age and the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage nor can they die any more, for they are equal to the angels and are sons of God. Notice, we are sons of God. How? Being sons of the resurrection. We're born of God by a resurrection, as the whole Bible explains. We will be spirit beings like angels, and yet full sons of God, far above angels in power and might and authority and glory, as so much of the rest of the Bible reveals. At this point, my friends, I want to offer you absolutely free of charge one of the most encouraging and yet powerful booklets we have ever published. This booklet is entitled, Your Ultimate Destiny. This booklet will open your eyes to the real mystery of life itself. It will help you understand why you are alive. This booklet, Your Ultimate Destiny, will point to you toward the ultimate purpose for your very existence it will help you really understand why you were born. So write or call today and request your free copy. Be sure to request and study this extremely informative booklet. Call now and request your booklet entitled Your Destiny. Just ask for your destiny. That's all you need.
This informative booklet is yours absolutely free. No cost, no obligation. If you call this toll-free number, 1-800-934-5579. That's 1-800-934-5579. Or send your request to Tomorrow's World, P.O. Box 3800, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28227. With this offer, you will also receive your free subscription to Tomorrow's World magazine, full of timely articles and unique insights on today's important issues. Tomorrow's World magazine keeps you up to date with world trends, Bible prophecy, and the very meaning of life itself. Tomorrow's World. Call now. Now back to our topic, my friends. Why are you really alive? Notice now here, Hebrews chapter 2, and turn to verse 5. For he has not put the world to come. We call this program Tomorrow's World. Here, Paul called it the world to come, of which we speak in subjection to angels, but one testified in a certain place, saying, What is man that you're mindful of him? Or the son of man that you take care of him? You made him a little lower and as the margin says, perhaps a little while lower, only for a little time lower than the angels. You crowned him with glory and honor, and you set him over the works of your hands. And you have put all things in subjection under his feet. Wow, we have tremendous power. The big lions and tigers and elephants don't put us in cages and take us to zoos. We do that to them because we're made to a limited extent like God. We're given authority. We're put on here on earth to learn how to use that. That's why we're created in God's image. That why, why, is why man was given creative imagination, so we can be like God, and so we can eventually truly conquer space, but in an entirely different way than man understands. You put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him, notice what your Bible says. He left nothing that is not put under him. And some of the Greek scholars and commentators puzzle over this. If you read the commentaries, they sense that the wording used here means the entire universe, but they don't know how to explain it. They don't know what God's purpose is. Hopefully you'll begin to grasp that purpose by the end of this program. And if you read and study the booklet we offer, Your Ultimate Destiny, you'll understand even more. And that he put all in subjection under man. He left nothing that is not put under him. Nothing in the entire universe. But we do not yet see all things under him. My friends, do you truly believe the Holy Bible is God's revelation to man? Then you must come to understand the truth about why you were really born. Because literally dozens of scriptures explain this. Going on, he says here, in verse 9, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the sufferings of death. Christ had to die to reconcile us to God so we can fulfill his purpose. Because we have Christ in us. We can have the right character at that point through Christ in us to be fit to have eternal life in a glorified spirit body by Christ in us. For the suffering of death, he was crowned with glory and honor that he, by the grace of God, might test death for everyone. For it was fitting for him, Christ, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, and bringing many sons to glory. Notice that phrase. Many sons, not a few sons, many sons to glory, to make the author of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one, for which reason he's not ashamed to call them brethren. Yes, we are brothers with Christ. Mankind has read these scriptures, but mankind has basically watered them down. Most people think, well, these are just sentimental things, and they don't really mean what they say. We're not going to be full brothers of Christ. We're not really going to be like Christ, they say. Somehow most religious leaders just can't believe that God really means what he says in the dozens and dozens of verses in this book talking about us being born of God and sharing in the glory of God and being full sons of God, real sons of God and real brothers of Jesus Christ. My brothers would not be some lesser beings. 
They would not be like goats or chickens. If you have brothers, they're not like that. They're the same basic level of existence you are. So will Christ's brothers be when we understand. So will God's sons be when we understand. Notice back in 1 John, near the end of the New Testament here, 1 John chapter 3 and verse 1. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. Therefore the world does not know us because it did not know Him. Beloved, now are we the children of God. Yes, we're begotten of God. We have His Spirit in us to help us grow, to help us overcome. But it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when He is revealed, listen, we shall be like Him, like Christ, for we shall see Him, Christ, as He is. We're going to really be like Christ. We're going to be able to look in the face of God because Christ is now God, and we shall see Him as He is. We'll be like Him, it says. Notice Revelation, the book of Revelation, just a couple of pages ahead here in your Bible, near the end. Revelation chapter 1, verse 12. This describes what Christ looks like. Then I turned to see the voice of one who spoke to me, John writes. Revelation 1, verse 12. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet, and girded about the chest with a golden band. His head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire, flaming fire coming out from this great being. His feet were like fine brass, and as if refined in a furnace. And his voice is the sound of many waters like the great waves on the Pacific up in the Big Sur country, crashing over those mighty rocks up there, like the sound of rolling thunder out on the plains, as the book of Psalms reveals God's voice. He had in his right hand seven stars. Out of his uh, mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance, Christ's face, as it was seen by John, was like the sun shining in its strength. The full power of the sun, and we will look right in Christ's face because we will be like him. We will be spirit-born sons of the resurrection. What a tremendous understanding. Think about this, my friends. The Bible says what it means, and it means what it says. The true saints of God will assist Christ in ruling this entire earth. That is our destiny if we truly surrender to Christ and let Christ rule our lives. Let's understand. Turn back here, if you would, to John chapter 17, the final uh, prayer, the last real full prayer that Jesus gave, a complete prayer. John chapter 17. Jesus spoke these words, John 17, verse 1. Follow, look it up. He lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. As you've given him authority over all flesh, that he give eternal life to as many as you've given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. To really know God, not just know about him, but to know him, be acquainted with him, walk with him, that is life. I have glorified you on the earth, Jesus prayed. I have finished the work which you've given me to do. And now, O oh Father, glorify me together, get this, together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Give me back that same glory that I had as the second person in the Godhead when I said, let there be light, and there was light. That's what Jesus Christ had done as the Logos, the Word, the great one who divided the waters of the Red Sea, who thundered from the top of Mount Sinai, who gave the Ten Commandments, who performed the miracles. That rock was Christ, as it says in 1 Corinthians 10, 4. Jesus finished up his prayer here in verse 20. I do not pray for these alone, just his disciples, but also for them who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory, get this, the glory which you gave me, Jesus prayed, I have given them that same glory. 
I have given them that they may be one just as we are one. Not some lesser oneship, not some lesser glory, that same glory. That's what Jesus said. And the glory which you've given uh, me, I gave them that they may be one just as we are one. I in them and you in me that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. We are loved by God, my friends. He's made us in His image. He wants us in His family. He wants other great beings with whom He can share eternity. He'll always be the Father. Christ will always be our elder brother and our leader, our head, our living head, our high priest. But we will be there right with them on that same general level of existence. Full sons of God in the kingdom of God. Helping rule this world. Helping rule this vast universe. Having tremendous power. The awesome ability to travel to Alpha Centauri, to Pluto, to Saturn. And do things all over this universe. This is why you and I are alive. This is why Christ died for you and for me. To give us this kind of glory and to share eternity with us. Let's do our part. Let's obey God, give our lives to God, cry out to God, and with all our being, seek for this understanding, act upon it, and try to fulfill the purpose for which God has brought us into being. Again, my friends, be sure to call or write now for your free copy of our powerful booklet entitled, Your Ultimate Destiny. This is a wonderful booklet. It's an eye-opening booklet, something you've never read, never anything like this before. This inspiring booklet, Your Ultimate Destiny, will explain why you are alive more fully than I can possibly do on this brief program. So call now and request your free copy of Your Ultimate Destiny. This booklet will really help you understand why you were born and the purpose of human existence. This booklet will give you real purpose for your life. So call now. Just ask for the booklet on your destiny. That's all you need to do. Call the toll-free number on the screen. Pick up the phone and call and tune in every week to the Tomorrow's World program. On this program, you will gain precious information and insights available nowhere else. Richard Ames and I will give you real understanding of what's going on and of the exciting prophecies of Tomorrow's World. See you right here next week. This informative booklet is yours absolutely free. No cost, no obligation. If you call this toll-free number, 1-800-934-5579. That's 1-800-934-5579. Or send your request to Tomorrow's World, P.O. Box 3800, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28227. All the literature offered on today's program can be ordered absolutely free off our website at www.tomorrowsworld.org. The preceding program is produced by the Living Church of God.